Hello everybody, uh, how are you? I'm glad we had a break, that was good. Uh, it's been amazing to be here so far and I just want to thank everyone for the organisation, uh, putting all of these things together, it's not easy. Um, and, you know, just thinking about how many, all the intricacies that have to happen to make a conference or a symposium like this work. I mean, we manage classrooms, the teachers got 30 children. Uh, there's thousands of things going on here in the background, so uh, a, a real privilege to be here. Just while the clicker comes, so I can move the slides because it's on its way, um, there's been a lot of talk about parents uh, and the implication that parenting has on the way that we teach. An interesting statistic to share with you, um, every month a child will spend about 140 hours in school, but 540 at home. So when parents come to school and hand their child over and say, fix my child, um, the real emphasis is at home. That's where the education actually is. Uh, what parents are, the children will become. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say is that there's a really famous analogy, which is when a child comes home to uh, her father and says, Dad, Dad, I got 18 out of 20 in my maths test. And the father says, let's sit down and go through the two answers you got wrong. And the daughter says, no, Dad, let's sit down and go through the 18 that I got right. And I think that's really important that the emphasis, the change, the shift in our success of what we quantify with our students is really not about the grade. It's about the effort they put in, the determination, the perseverance, the love, all of those things that we find unmeasurable. It's hard to quantify those things. So the talk, an A to Z guide through Montessori into mainstream. Thank you so much. Um, there's, a, there's a real stigma in Montessori. Um, I was a mainstream teacher for 15 years, I then retrained as a Montessori teacher, I'm now the Montessori ambassador for Australia. And there's a real stigma that if you're not 100% Montessori, then you're not Montessori, so don't do it. And a lot of people don't know even what Montessori is. In fact, when I was introduced to it, I thought it was a cult. I thought, whoa, <laughs> I'm not going to join a cult. Um, but it's not a cult, in actual fact. Uh, Maria Montessori was an amazing innovator. A woman, she graduated from university as the first doctor in Italy. Mussolini ousted her, she became really good friends with Gandhi, and um, she was a big observer. She observed children. She sat and she watched. And what she realized was there was an, in an innate um, perseverance within children to just learn, without any guidance, without any teachers, without anyone telling them what to do. Uh, she saw children in the streets in Milan who had nothing, gathering stones and sticks and then putting them into groups of stones that were the same color. So she was uh, we're looking at patterns and order here in mathematics, getting sticks and putting them into groups of four or groups of three, division and multiplication. So she realized that there was this thing happening within children that they really didn't need too much telling. We didn't really need to tell them too much of what they needed to do. They could do it themselves. But we're breaking a stigma here because um, as we travel around the world and talk to schools, uh, people say, you shouldn't be telling non-Montessori teachers about Montessori. They're not Montessori trained. Don't tell them. Keep it to the Montessori people over here. And I've been, uh, you know, uh, my name has been thrown around a little bit in the Montessori community because I'm the one who goes out and says, hey, look, this is real gold dust. We've got to share this because it's, it's fantastic. And so I'm here today to share it with you. Now, I'm not here to tell you what to do, your teachers, your professionals, I would never do that. I'm a teacher just like you. Um, so if anything comes across as patronizing, I'm already sorry for that, and I'm not here to patronize you. You're, you're just, we're, we're all equal in here in that. But what I am here to do today is share with you some ideas. I've been to hundreds of PDs, and I'm sure you all have too, and sometimes they're so boring and I want to leave five minutes into it because someone is just standing at the front talking. And I've been given the big task of doing 90 minutes with you. So if you're already bored, I'm so sorry. But you it's not going to continue. During this session, we're going to do a few things. Um, number one, it's going to be interactive. So you're going to be talking and writing. So if you've got something that you can write with, whether it's a mobile phone, a piece of paper, a laptop, something you can write with, that would be amazing, because you're going to be writing as, as we go through it. Number two, I'm going to give you tons and tons of resources. So, you know, we talked about COVID and, and the benefits of it. One of the amazing things was the QR code. We'd all seen them and thought, what do they do? These QR codes now, I mean, they're amazing. They're everywhere. And so I'm going to flash up some QR codes to you. And when you do, if you like what you see, just get your phone, scan it, and it will download a resource and you can keep it forever. And these are resources that I've made specifically for this conference, this symposium. And uh, if, you, if you want them, if you grab them, I promise you, 
They will help you. And you don't have to take them. And in fact, you don't have to listen to anything I'm about to say. But I hope that something I do say to you today sticks. Because I was a Montessori teacher and a mainstream teacher. And I want to kind of bring it to you. Okay. Let's get started then. So, I put this picture on the screen for a reason. Um, uh, I've done a lot of work around the world. I've spent the last seven years in Nepal, and I've been building schools in the Himalayas. We built ten schools. I run the three largest teacher training centers in the country. Uh, seven years ago, there wasn't one Montessori school in Nepal. Now there's about two and a half thousand. And that's because women from the villages have come to our teacher training centers. They've been trained in Montessori for three months, for free, and then they go and open their own school. And uh, the question is, why do we do everything that we do? Teaching is hard. You've got paperwork, you've got parents. Good as me, you've got parents. That's hard. <laughs> you've got planning, you've got assessment, you've got, you've got all these things to do. Why do you do it? It's very difficult. You do it because of the boy in the blue jumper's smile. That's why you do it. Uh, we do it for that. There's no better reward than a child enjoying coming to your class, coming to your school, enjoying your lesson. Nothing better than that. No pay rise, no pat on the back, no mention in the staff meeting is going to ever supersede that smile over there. Uh, and I put that picture up in my house, in my office, and in my school as a reminder that that's why we do what we do. So I'll just read this to you. When a school community chooses to prioritize the well-being of their students, the sustainability of the planet, and the engagement of the entire school community, as the foundation of their educational philosophy, they empower the students to make a difference in the world. This purposeful approach to education fosters engagement among all stakeholders through agency, choice, and the development of essential life skills. When students are rewarded for the impact they have had on others, education thrives and school becomes a place of positive change in education. Change is the only constant, so let's make it purposeful. And today we're going to talk about exactly that. So before we get into the nuts and bolts, and this has been brought up a few times, luckily I've made this resource that you might want. Um, it's very important, especially if you're an educational leader, but also if you're a teacher, this is also important, that you know all the stakeholders. We've, stakeholders have been mentioned already, that you know their voice. What do they want? Why are they coming to your school? What is their purpose? And if you think about this, you've got students, teachers, and parents. And I won't go through all of them, but look at some of those quotes by students. Teach me something new. It excites me. It also excites us. Look at another one. Allow me to choose my own path. It's very important, and we lose this sometimes. We look at our teachers. I want to bring my passion into the classroom. I'm a rock climber. I want to bring rock climbing into the classroom, but my principal says, this is the documentation you're going to say to the kids. There are ways of linking every single thing that we do into the education system. So we have to let our teachers be able to do that. And look at our parents. I want my children to find their passion in life. Very important, these things and these voices. And once we know this and we have the voice for everybody, we can really move upon that. And, and so obviously, this is an example. These will pop over now again. If you like what you see, you scan the QR code. It will come to your phone, and you can keep it and use it as you wish. So the only constant in education is change. And we're on a journey of reflection. Now, here's where today's activity comes in, if you wish, and you don't have to. We're going to go through the alphabet, and I'm sure you know the alphabet. Teachers, there's one thing we definitely do know is the alphabet. We're going to go through the A to Z of Montessori. And we're going to talk about Montessori and how you can bring it to mainstream, or some of the aspects of it. So I'm going to go through the letters of the alphabet. It might sound pretty dull, but it should be quite fun. Uh, and in your, uh, in your piece of paper, on your booklet, you can do two things. First of all, you can reflect upon what you see and say, hey... I already do that. I do that really well. It's very important to let yourself know what you already do and what you do well. We're going to make yourself a strategic plan. School principals know about these things. You have to present it to your board and say to the board of governors, over the next three years, here's what I'm going to achieve. Here's what we're already doing. You're going to make one for yourself today. You're going to talk about what you already do that's really good and what you want to improve upon over the next year. Things that you might see today and go, you know what, I'm going to do that. Because I think that makes a successful, um, any PD is successful when you walk away from it and you want to go and start straight away tomorrow in your classroom. I can't wait to begin. And I hope at the end of today's session that that happens to you. I hope that one of you says, oh my God, I'm going to begin straight away tomorrow on my journey. So you might want to make two columns just like this, or you might not. You might want to listen. It's up to you completely. Okay, so let's start. So let's go with A. A is for atmosphere. Your classroom's got to be a warm and inviting place. 
Children have to, go, have to feel safe and comfortable in your environment. Public humiliation. If you're naughty, you'll be at the front and I'm going to tell everybody what you have done is not a safe and supportive environment. It has to be safe. We know neurologically, if our children do not feel safe and secure, it's almost impossible to learn. So it has to be comfortable. It has to be a nice place to be. And there's one extra thing. I'm going to prove to you that just teaching facts and assessing it doesn't work by doing this. In the bottom right corner on every slide, you'll see the sign language for the letter I'm talking about. And at the very end, I'm going to give you a quiz on sign language and show you it doesn't work, <laughs> just to prove it to you. So there's A. I won't focus on it, but you know it's there. So how, to, how can we get there? How can we actually get A into your classrooms if we want to? Well, we've got several options here. We can create an organized environment. We can build positive relationships and encourage collaboration, celebrate diversity, or foster independence. And the reason I put a picture here, this is a diary. I found that what Montessori gave to me was this amazing ability to allow my children to choose. And a simple diary. You give every single child in your class a diary. And you say to them, every day you have one page. And when you walk in the door in the morning, between 8 and 8.15, there's no teaching, there's no talking, there's no nothing. That's your time. You're going to plan your day. You can see on the wall there's a schedule for the day. There's the, there's the timetable. But you might see that there's a space in the timetable. There's 10 minutes or 15 minutes where nothing is happening. And that's where you get to choose something. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You choose. And they say, what? I get to choose anything? You say, yes. In that 15 minutes, you can do whatever you like. But here are the rules. It's got to be within the curriculum. You have to do something we've taught before. It's got to be a topic in the classroom. It's got to be something we've, we've discussed previously. You give them a choice. You give them some freedom. This will allow your students to understand that they're part of the, part of the classroom, part of the movement, part of the responsibility of how it works. Then we go to B. B is for boundaries, setting clear boundaries in your classroom. Boundaries for behavior. Yes, sometimes they're too strict. You must sit down. And if you want to go to the toilet, you must ask me, the teacher. I will tell you when your brain and your bladder are communicating. No. If your bladder and your brain are communicating, off you go. You don't need to ask me. I trust the evolution of millions of years that your brain and bladder can talk to each other. And I trust you to go to the bathroom. And yes, you'll make mistakes. You'll spend too long in there playing with the hand dryer. But we will reflect upon it later. How can we get it in our classrooms? You might want this. This is a great one. Getting to know your students on the first day of term or tomorrow. Try this. Your students are your customers. They come to school for a service. That service is guidance. You are their guide. But do you know what they want? Do you know what you want? they want? We do surveys all the time. I'm sure the STU do surveys all the time. What do our customers want? What do our, uh, our teachers need? Have you done a survey of your students? Put this on the table in front of a group of children and ask them, a terrific teacher says, a terrific teacher does, a terrific teacher does not, and a terrific teacher is, and ask them to talk, and then collect in the sheets of paper, and then be what they want you to be. And then your life will be easier, and your children will understand that, hey, I'm heard, I'm listened to. What I want matters, and your life will be easier too because you're not trying to do something which is irregular to them. C, creativity. We know the most famous TED Talk of all time by Sir Ken Robinson is all about creativity. Of course, creativity is crucially important. It's essential for helping children develop their self-expression. Yes, but how can you get it into your rooms? Well, here is this amazing diagram which will help you, hopefully. We forget sometimes that our children are probably the most creative beings on the planet, way more creative than we are. We've seen them in the garden talking to a daffodil, you know, or a, you know, a playing teacher with a broom handle. Okay? We don't do that. We don't have that ability anymore, but our children do. So look at this. A teacher-centered learning approach is I am the oracle, and you will sit down, and I will tell you everything you need to know because I know everything. I am Google. Listen to me. And I'm going to test you on what I said. And if you remember everything, yes, 100%. However, our children all have beliefs. They have experiences. They have their own knowledge. It's circular. Are we taking that into responsibility? How are we listening to our students and incorporating them into the learning process in our classrooms? 
Take a look at the right-hand side. We want to have a student-centered approach more than a teacher-centered learning environment where it's top-down. And if we can move towards that, and really it's about talking to our administrators, our, our principals, our heads of department. If you come to my classroom and there's movement, and if there's noise, then that's success. If you come to my classroom and all the kids have got their fingers on their lips and they're sitting up straight with a straight back because you're the principal, that's a failure. And we have to move towards that because when we go into the head offices of some of our most successful companies, we don't see everyone sitting with a straight back and their fingers on their lips when Mark Zuckerberg walks in the office. We see them talking and debating and moving and arguing and innovating and experimenting and making mistakes. And so we want to have that in our rooms. D is for discovery. Can they explore the world around them? Can they decide on what they explore? And how can we do it? Well, it's really easy, especially here in Singapore. There's a lot of resources around. I mean, I saw a giant snail this morning as big as my hand walking past my hotel. If I was teaching anything to do with insects or pollinators, I would have grabbed that snail, popped it on a leaf, taken it to school, and said, this week we're learning about pollinators and we're not going to get a textbook out or look at a YouTube video because there's a pollinator right on the table. And even though it's a snail, and you might think it's just a snail, they're everywhere. You watch the children as you tell them. Now, the snail is feeling really anxious because he doesn't know what we are, but he's in his shell, and he might pop his head out during the lesson at any point. Keep your eye on him. Every child will be watching that snail like a hawk. And the minute he pops one antenna out, it's, it's, it's coming out. It's trusting us. The kids will never forget that. They'll go home that day and say, Mom, guess what happened at school today? We had a snail on the table and he trusted us and popped his antenna. <gasps> They'll remember it. And maybe let them stroke the shell really carefully and then put it back in the garden really, really meticulously and teach them the value of nature and, and you know, all of these wonderful care and empathy and love that we want. It's right there on your doorstep. We go to YouTube very easily. We go to Baidu. We go to all these textbooks and we think, wow, no. Actually, real education is out in the natural world. It's right there. It needs to be tangible. You have to be able to touch it and feel it. And watch what happens to your students when you do that. E is for the environment. Prepare it carefully. But what's really important at this point, and I've made this mistake for 15 years, and I didn't know why until I became a Montessori teacher. I used to come in in the holidays and redesign my entire classroom. I'd move all the shelves, the tables, I'd put new posters up. I'd spend two weeks doing it. I was really proud. I'd look at my classroom and go, whoa, that looks great. Kids would come in, two weeks, first two weeks of school, chaos. Kids were crazy. It was wild. I couldn't figure it out every time. Then I became a Montessori teacher, and I learned why. I didn't involve the children. So when they came to school after two weeks, everything had moved. They didn't know where the books were or where their seat was or the posters had all changed, and they had to start to feel comfortable. So they had two weeks of figuring it out and exploring the room, and that was the chaos because they didn't feel safe in an environment that was unfamiliar to them. And I learned very quickly. I should have involved them. In the last week, I should have said, we're going to redesign the classroom, and you're going to do it with me. Where do you think I should put the new bookcase? Gavin, I think it'd be good over here. Okay, let's put it over here. Come back, and collective responsibility is informed. And the point I'm trying to make here is that all your children learn differently. And we know that there are lots of different types of learning auditory, visual, all those we know. But there are actually four types of learners. And this is really important and very hard, actually. Many teachers uh, will say, no, it's not possible to do this. But it's really important that you know this, that there are four types of learners in your room. Do you know who they are, what they are, and can you honestly say there is a space for each of them? And let me tell you what they are. An isolated learner, this is not a punishment. They want to work on their own. They don't want to work with anybody else. They don't want to talk they do not want to do anything. They just want to come to school for eight hours and plow work out. They want to work really hard and go home. You know, we have people in offices. We have, I have teachers in my school. They don't want to talk. They don't go to the staff room ever. But they are the greatest teachers ever. And we leave them alone, and they teach, and they're unbelievable. But quite often in our schools, we say, right, we're all sitting in pairs. And those children who are isolated, they go, I don't want to sit in pairs. Actually, I want to sit on my own. Uh, but you force them to sit in pairs because you think that it's good for them, but it's not good for them. And then you've got your parallel learners. These are two children who work together, and they do the same work at the same time with the same pencil and the same book, and they use the same colors, and they sit next to each other, even wear the same T-shirts, and, you know, they rely on each other. 
They're insecure. They're not sure they're doing it right. But if someone else is doing it next to them and gets it wrong, well, that's fine. Because two of us, it's okay. And I've got a comrade here. We're doing it together. Have you got a space for those guys? Cooperative learners. These are two children who sit together, but they're not at the same level. And they don't need each other, but they're friends. And they want to sit next to each other. And they do different work. One's doing maths. One's doing art. And they're chatting. How's your maths? How's your art? It's going great. Did you watch that TV show? Yes, I did. That's wonderful. blah de blah They're besties. They're cooperative learners. And then you've got your collaborative learners. These are groups. This is where your child who is disengaged and lost goes to find a leader. And this is where your leader goes to lead a group. (laughs) Do you have a space for them? What I'm trying to say is in your room, if you have all your tables facing the same way, and when I saw a picture of this auditorium, I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is the opposite of what I'm going to say in my speech. Everyone's facing the same way, and I'm going to talk for 90 minutes, so I'm kind of being hypocritical, so I apologize. If I had my way, you'd all be in group tables with some of the people facing the wall over here, you know, we'd all be doing it differently. Do you have a space for these guys? Is there a table in your room facing the wall with no stimulation? where a child who's got undiagnosed sensory processing disorder wants to work, but there's no space for them to go. But the added complication here is that you as the teacher have to have the confidence to say to your children, now sit where you want. You choose where you sit. I'm not going to tell you. And what will happen is your children will sit where's best for them. It's true. Some of you will probably know this. If you are working at school holidays now, right, and you're like, I've got to do some programming, So if you do it in a cafe, facing out of a window into a street, I don't know about you, but me, I will do zero work. Because I'll be looking, oh my goodness, look at those shoes. Wow, look at that bird. Wonder where that airplane's going. Those trees are really lovely and green. And eight hours are gone, I've done zero work. Because I'm just so stimulated by all the things happening. But you face me against a wall with nothing, and I can work for eight hours and write teacher programs. And I did this yesterday, this slideshow, facing a wall. Um, because if I faced out of a window, we wouldn't have a slideshow today. It would be a terrible. And so do you have a space for those children in your, in your classroom? And if not, then start testing the waters and see what happens. And here's a, an example of that. On the left-hand side, this is my classroom. This is my stage one class, Montessori Children's House, three to six. You can't see the teacher. Invisible. A lot of learning going on in there. I tell you, I was in that room. Children working, communicating, sitting on their own, some on the floor, some standing up, some walking around, some moving, talking, learning, 101. Insane amount of working happening in that classroom. But there's no teacher. In fact, the teacher's behind the bookshelf working with one child, and she knows she can trust all the children to get on with their work because she's got independence as a key driver in her room. On the right-hand side, that's the Airbnb head office in San Francisco. You can see the parallels between the two. We're not going to send our children into a world where they're sitting in rows silently with straight backs and fingers on lips. So why do we design our classrooms in that way? We shouldn't. F is for freedom. Freedom of choice, independence, and with a structured environment in the background. How can you do it? There's lots of ways you can do it. One of them is simplest is by rewriting your school mantra, your constitution, your rules, we call them. I'm not saying, you know, do not do this, do not do that, but saying, this is how we are. This is what we do in this room. And say to the children, what would you like to be? What would you like our school to be? And they say, we care for living things no matter how small. That's one of our rules. That's what we do in here. That's who we are. And they start to stand proud about the kind of things that they believe in. These are values. This is a values-based education conference. So this is what we want. Very simple way to do it, very easy and quick way to do it is restructure your rules and not have don'ts, but have this is who we are. This is what we do. You know, we're teachers. This is what we do as teachers. This is what we do as students. G is for grace and courtesy, a tricky one, but it really means manners and it means a good person and being polite. You see this in a Montessori classroom all day long, every day. How can we do it? Many ways to do it, but one of the best ways is modeling it. I had a teacher at school who would shout at me with a red face. He was called Mr. Bun. I'll never forget him. His face would turn into a huge tomato, and he would shout really loud. But then when we spoke with a loud voice, we'd have a detention. And my argument in my head was, you're modeling shouting. You're saying, hey, when I get upset, I just shout. So do that. (laughs) But then he was saying, don't do that. And my father used to say, do as I say, not as I do which is completely wrong, obviously, because we know that the rule is 
what you are, they will become. So if you want your children to speak quietly, speak quietly. If you want them to take care of animals and plants and insects, do that in front of them. We had an experiment in my school where we wanted to, we wanted to um, include silent reading in the school as a meditative time. We wanted children after lunch, when they were all hot and bothered, Australia is like very hot, 40 degrees in the summer, and we wanted them to come in and just, ah, have some time. So we decided we we're going to have silent reading. And they we're going to come in, choose a book, and they could sit on a bean bag or on a poof or somewhere and just read. And one of my teachers at school said, Gavin, it's not going to work, because the kids, they didn't want to read for pleasure. And one another teacher said, why don't we just model it then? Why don't we have this space of half an hour where it's, you can choose what you want to do in your calming down time and all the teachers are going to grab a book and go to the library and sit and read and we'll just see how long it takes until all the children are reading. No word of a lie, four days it took until every class, every kid was reading in silence after lunch because they looked at the teacher and thought, hey, hey he's reading for pleasure, he looks so calm. I'm reading for pleasure. And a lot of the time, the children would go and grab the same book as the teacher and want to read the same book, whether it's Terry Pratchett or whether it was Harry Potter, so they could then have a conversation about it. Very important that we model the behavior we wish to view in our children. We can't do one thing and expect them to actually do something different because they're going to look at you and say, well, you know, the most famous comment from any child in 25 years of being a teacher is, it's not fair. And what they mean is, you're doing it. Why can't I do it? H is for hands-on learning. We've heard it. It's on every website in the world. Well, we're a hands-on learning school. We're all about, you know, touch. And we're all about, you know, the hand to the brain learning. But do we actually know what it means? The next picture might shock you, so don't be scared. Uh, it's actually just a depiction of a child. So have a look at this. This is homunculus. Um, it's a famous model recently studied by uh, professors uh, over at Harvard University and MIT. And what they did was they took around about 7,000 children and they wanted to see the organs in the body and how much cognitive impact they had on learning. So after this huge study with all of these children, they came up with this model. What do we know? By looking at the model, we know one really important thing. There's no ears. What do we do in our classrooms? Don't talk. I'm talking, I'm the teacher. I'll tell you what you need to know. Silence, fingers on lips. We do that. We found, look, there's no ears. Yes, we can learn by learning, but when we look at their hands, we realize something really important, that our hand really is the gateway to the brain. And when our children can touch things, they will learn a great deal. So what's your objective? To attempt, and it's very hard, I admit, to attempt for your children to be able to touch something in your lessons? Is there something they can touch? I'm not talking about a fidget toy or some kind of squishy. I'm talking about something which is related to the lesson you're teaching. If you're teaching the evolution of fish and how they migrated from the ocean to the land over millions of years, have a fish on the table. It can be from a market. You can fillet it with the kids and make tacos and eat it and taste it and recycle the bones and all of that stuff. But have a fish and let the children touch the scales or touch the eyeball. And then you watch how much they take in from your lesson compared to your textbook with a picture of a fish or a diagram that was written by Oxford University Press. See the difference in the learning and see the response when they go home and say, Mom, guess what? You know, when children come home, what do you do today at school? Nothing. If they've touched a fish's eyeball that day, there's going to be something. I touched a fish's eyeball, Mom. How was it? Well... Did you know, Mum, that fish have evolved from the ocean to the land? Did you know, Mum, that the blue whale, by the way, this is a really cool fact I learned in Antarctica, the blue whale evolved from the ocean onto the land, didn't like it, and evolved back into the ocean again. Then you tell them that, and you let them touch a fish, the scales, the gills. Let them put their fingers in the gills. and go, oh, it's gooey. They go home, and, and they've got, it, it's cemented. Can we try our best to allow our children to touch. And the second thing is, look at the mouth. A lot of talking needs to happen in your classroom. A lot of talking. My teacher told me, sit on your hands. They're touching too much. Okay, she was saying, stop learning in the way you need to learn. And I didn't know then, but I do now. Um, 
but touch and talk. So your classrooms need to be a place where there's movement, there's touching and there's chatting and there's talking and there's communication. 100%. I mean, we're failing our students otherwise. Eyes for independence. This is the overall for me. When uh, I had to do a strategic plan at my school and present to my board what my ultimate goal was for my school, this was the top. Independent. I wanted my children to be independent. If they're independent, then we win because they get a chance to choose and they have freedom and they have agency. How can we do it? If you, don't, if you scan anything, you definitely scan this one. Uh, there are 40 essential skills uh, that are the most prevalent in the top industries in the world. And I did the research myself. Um, huge companies like uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, uh, SpaceX, Tesla, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Wikipedia. What do they look for in their, uh, in their future employees? They do not look for resumes with 100% on 96s on 94s. They look for skills. We call them essential skills or soft skills or core skills. I put them together, the top 40, and I made a booklet for you. And I've divided the booklet into four terms. And each of those top 40 skills, I've divided them one week each. So you download it. You've got a booklet full of activities for you to do in your school. And all you do as a school is you say, oh, everybody, look, it's week one. This week we're talking about humility. Now, you can't teach these things. They're impossible. You can't say, guys, let's have a lesson on humility. Okay, humility is this. Okay, now let's do a test on humility. Everybody's humble now. Well done, guys. You're all humble. Great A's in humility. Can't do that. You have to practice it. You have to do it yourself. You have to see it in your classroom. And then when you have a group time or a circle time, and you say, hey, guys, it's week one. Did anybody see anybody being humble this week? And little Stephanie says, uh, miss, I saw somebody being humble. They did a great piece of work. They put it on the wall, but they didn't show off or tell anybody about it. They were being humble. I said, That's great. I'm really glad you spotted that humility. Okay? And if we work towards this as a school, then just maybe our community will change. It's not just our kids. It's our teachers. It's ourselves. We also have to practice these things. So there's 40. They're there for you. If you want them, you can take it. Um, I actually put this online and 190,000 people downloaded it off of LinkedIn. So I knew it was good. So that's why I'm telling you, if you want it, uh, you can also have it. Okay, great. J is for joy. Of course, this goes without saying. Enthusiasm for learning. Is your classroom a fun place to come? If it's a place of fear, then you might as well quit. We don't want to scare your children into learning. That is not it at all. We want them to run into the classroom smiling. I can't wait to get to school for my project on dinosaurs. You know, I, we want them to be joyful in their learning. How do we do it? Well, I've got my snail out here. You make it fun for you. You make it fun for you. If it's fun for you, it's fun for them. They will see the big smile on your face. If you're enjoying it, they will enjoy it. I find snails interesting. I mean, I'll give you another fact. Snail has more teeth than any creature on the planet. 17,000 teeth. It's a lot of teeth. You might forget that fact, but if I had a snail here for you to touch, and you could touch the antenna a bit, and then you could place it in the garden later, you wouldn't forget the fact. You'd remember it, because the hand to the brain would cement the knowledge. It's very cool. So you have to make it fun for you. That's the really important part. K is for kindness. We have to model kindness. There's no question about that. Obviously, we talk about our children being happy. What makes us the happiest? When we're kind. When we, when we feel we've done something really good, we feel extremely happy within ourselves. Empathy is important. How to get there? Share it. Share the kindness. Share the kindness you've seen in the classroom. Share the kindness that's been observed by the other children. Have what's called an empathy circle. Sit down and talk about it. Did we see anything today that was empathetic? Did anyone see anybody else being kind? L is for learning. A love of learning. I'm sure all of your school, school websites say love of learning on them. I'm sure they do. But does it actually happen in your school? Is it happening in your classroom? And this is not your fault. None of these things are down to you. Actually, the administration or the very high level up in government is to blame. If our governments are comparing our schools against each other and saying, these are the top schools in Singapore, number one, then our schools are saying, oh my goodness, if we want enrollments, we've got to climb the ladder. We've got to get up there, guys. All right, how do we get up there? We get better grades. All right, how do we get better grades? Well, we test the kids more. Yes, we have a really strict curriculum where the teacher gets no agency, so the children get no choice. And then, uh, yeah, we get good grades that way. But at the end of the line is a child who's disengaged and the love of learning is uh, diluted. 
This is probably the most common thing I've seen, and anyone who's visited lots of schools will have seen this too. And if you do this, I'm sorry, uh, but hopefully you will say, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, there's a difference between product-driven learning and process-driven learning. Product-driven learning is this. Hey guys, today we're all going to learn about mice and we're going to make a model of a mouse. On your tables, there is a paper plate. I've already colored it for you. There's two um, triangles of gray card. I've already cut them out for you. There's a pink circle. I've already prepared it for you. And some string. I've already cut the length. It's eight centimeters. Okay, guys, everyone grab the paper plate. We're going to stick the nose on together. Let's stick the nose on. Now we're going to put the whiskers on. Yay! And at the end of the day, there's a really good photo of all the kids holding up their mice. Every mouse is the same. No choice, no freedom, no agency, no mistakes, no individuality, no creativity, no uniqueness, zero. But it looks good for the school website. And when mum sees that mouse when she gets home, she thinks, whoa, what a beautiful mouse. What she doesn't know is that it was all product driven. It was a warehouse churning out these mice. We need to move towards process driven learning. Guys, we're gonna make a mouse today. I've made a mouse, here's mine. You don't have to do a mouse like mum, but you can copy it if you want. Now in the classroom are loads of resources. You can use anything you want. You can work with whom you wish. You can sit on the floor, stand up. You can work in pairs, groups, parallel, isolated. It's up to you, coordinated, cooperative. You can do whatever you like, but in half an hour, you all need to have a mouse. We're going to meet on the carpet and talk about our mice. It doesn't look much like a mouse, but the child had agency, choice, freedom, experimentation. There was mistakes, there was communication, and there's uniqueness and creativity. So we need to move away from um, the product driven and move towards process driven 100%. It might not look good, but it's more beneficial for our students. There's no question about that. M is for the Montessori philosophy. Uh, it's all about modeling. And this is where it comes down to us, the teachers. We must be what we want our students to become. This is paramount. If we want them to be confident, we must try new things. If we want them to embrace mistakes, we must make mistakes in front of them and say, I made a mistake, guys. If we shout one day, and I've shouted in class, I've been upset, I've been angry, then we must reflect upon it and say, look, I know, I, I shouted, I, I'm sorry about that, I, I lost my temper, I, I apologize. And children say, oh, so it's okay to make mistakes as long as we reflect upon it and then we apologize. Okay, I've learned that now. Okay, and we must be what we want them to be, that's a fact. And I'll share this with you. This is a really beautiful story that I love to tell. Um, I've built many schools in Nepal, maybe 10 or, or so, and lots of teacher training centers. And when I was a school principal uh, of my school, I wanted my children to follow in my footsteps. I wanted them to understand what it felt like to do good work. Because I realized, uh, and I'm not a rich man, but I'm very rich in heart because I've discovered this thing. That when I build schools in Nepal, there's nothing you can do that can supersede that. You can't give me a Ferrari, a golden nugget. Nothing will feel better than when we cut the ribbon and the children sit there and they've got a new school and there was no school two months before. And I wanted my children to feel the good, how good it feels to do good work. So these two children here in my school, and I said to the kids, hey guys, here is some pictures of a school in Nepal. It was so terrible. You can't believe how terrible it was. And I said, look, we really need to improve it, but I need some help. I don't have enough money or resources. Can you help? That's all I have. I'm going now. Bye. And I went to my office. I just told them that and showed them a few pictures. And this boy on the right-hand side, his father doesn't mind me naming him. He's called Callum. He came to my office with those set of pencils in his hand there. It was the next morning. He said, Gavin, um, I've got some pencils. I don't use them. They're in my drawer. Please take them to Nepal with you. And he gave me the set of pencils. Two months later, I had 10 suitcases filled with everything you can dream of. The kids just started rallying. It was insane. Shoes. One child gave me his shoes from his feet. I don't need these shoes, Gavin. Take them. No, no, no. Put your shoes back on. You know, they really wanted to give. And so I went to Nepal on this trip, five or six uh, schools later. And I came back after we built an entire school and I showed Callum this picture. And I said, Callum, remember those pencils you gave me? This child had never seen a piece of paper or a pencil in his life. I know it sounds hard to believe, but it's true. In a place called Carvre, up near Everest. I said, this is his first ever drawing, thanks to you. And he started crying. And he said, I want to do it again. And what I'm trying to tell you is, we need to model what we want out of our children. You know, we need to be that. And we need to tell them what we're up to. 
tell them the problems that we have sometimes and how you know it's okay to be anxious and nervous. We don't have to be this pinnacle of perfection who stands at the front, yes, I'm perfect all the time. I never do anything. No, that's not human. Be human. Be what you want them to be. It's very important. And this picture melts my heart. I, I was there when he drew that, and that's his house. The next picture he drew was me and him. It was just, it was really heart melting. It was gorgeous. And it's for nature. Bring nature into your uh, classroom as much as possible. It's right outside. You live in Singapore. Goodness me. Everything just grows here in one second. You just plant a seed, you've got a forest in a week. It's insane here. I just love it. It's amazing. Yes, Australia, not quite the same, uh, but it's still got its richness. How do we do it? Uh, I've got this for you. This is really cool. Um, we can bring it into our classroom. We can actually take it home with us too. And I made you this booklet. I think you'll like it. It's a nature-based homework. I'm not really into homework. I don't do homework. But if you're teaching butterflies or insects, then why not say, hey, guys, over the next week, I want you to go out and try to find as many as you can. Here you go. Here's a checklist. When you're out walking with your parents, when you're on your way to school, you see a butterfly, you take it off on the list. Okay, and you can do that. It can be a nature scavenger hunt. You can go out in the garden, do an insect hunt. You can take them out. Get them out there, get the fingers dirty, get dirt under their fingernails, get all grimy, and this is what our children want. They want to get out of the Oxford University Press booklet, and they want to get out into the garden and feel the world. Bring nature into it. You know the Barley Green School. I was there a few weeks ago. This is ridiculous. You know, you're in class, and a snake just slithers through the classroom, or an iguana, or a monkey's on the roof. And it's phenomenal. The children are alive because they are part of nature and we need to bring it into our classrooms. Oh, it's for observation. I'm going to, this next one, I hope the resource you, on the next one you love because it took me a very long time to make it. Observation is key. And I'll, I'll tell you why uh, it's key through the Montessori pedagogy. So, if our children are sitting in rows all day, filling in forms and worksheets and textbooks, and we are talking and they are listening, then they're not demonstrating any skills at all. They're not moving, they're not doing compromise, there's no negotiation, there's no debate, there's no nothing. All there is is listening skills and effort, and that's what we report. Tommy has made a lot of effort and is really good at listening. Yay! No skills involved. But if we let our students go, if we say, okay, guys, I've done the inspiration lesson, off you go, sit where you want, work on the floor, work in groups, you, know, you can use any resources you like, and we watch, we observe. If we watch them, in their natural environment, working, we will see them demonstrating core skills. I've made this for you. I hope you love it. It's called an observational wheel. I just made it up. Okay. Now, around the edge, there's the 40 skills that are in the other booklet. All of them are there, look. Resilience, self-care, compromise, determination, blah, 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 blah. At the end of the day, every day, before the children go home, you say, it's time for reflection, guys. Take out your observational wheel and they color in one of those sections depending on if they have tried to show it. I tried to show determination today, and they color it in. And you can see straight away, you'll see a little graph starting to appear. Wow, this guy is really determined. He's working on his determination. Every day he's colored in determination, every day. And you'll get to measure via the children and through reflection their core skills, because you can't test these things. But observing them and letting our children observe them too within themselves is really important. If you want it, there it is. P is for prepared environment. And we talked about this earlier on. But I think what's really important here is saying yes. And I actually made a T-shirt. The reason I put yes, I've got a T-shirt with yes on it. And I said to my students, if you have a question such as, can I use a card? Can I use the paint? Can I use the scissors? Can I go to the toilet? Can I move seats? Can I sharpen the pencil? The answer is yes, don't ask me. I'm not interested in that question. This is your classroom and mine. You know the rules. You can't climb out of the window and get an Uber to the city. That's not a thing. You can't exhaust the resources. Everything else is yes. You can. Just do it. All good. No problem. Yes. And when we say yes and we allow them that ultimate freedom, we see miracles happen. So the prepared environment means that everything is available and the answer is yes. So they don't need to ask you anymore. They just know that it is yes. Very hard to let go. It's really hard because we're used to having control. No, the paints are in a special cupboard, and I need to let... There are a padlock on there, and I need to open that padlock if you want to paint something. We don't want that. We want them to develop a sense of collective responsibility, so the answer is yes. Q is for questioning. This is to do with lesson structure. Let's see if uh, you like this. Um, 
so over the many years I've been working in education, I've worked in pedagogy and philosophy and I've written curriculums all over the world, especially in India recently for Ryan schools. We tried to reinvent what a classroom lesson looked like, the perfect lesson. And we, sum it, we, we summized it with this. We decided, and this goes back to the initial quote at the very beginning that great teachers inspire, that the beginning of your lesson needs to be inspirational. You must inspire them first. The second thing you must do is then question them. Now you're inspired, what do you want to know about the topic I've inspired you about? So for example, if I was teaching you about Antarctica, I might say to you that there is a bird which is three and a half meters in wingspan. It's called the wandering albatross. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. It's the largest bird on the planet, okay? And it can fly for four days without flapping its wings once. It locks in its humeruses and just glides for four days. It will also sleep whilst flying, fully asleep. And it will swoop into the ocean and scoop up salt water and then desalinate it in its brain, let the salt out through a special valve on its beak and drink fresh water. Now, it's pretty amazing. You're like, whoa, is that really a thing? Then I say to you, do you have any questions about birds? And all the hands go, yep. You know, and they all, why do birds eat, why do birds eat worms? That's a great question over there, Tommy. I don't know the answer, but I'm going to write it down. And I write down, why do birds eat worms? Another child says, uh, how come birds are so light? They're not very heavy. That's a great question. Even though I know the answer, I'm not going to tell them. I write it down. Another child says, uh, why do they sing? Are birds really dinosaurs? And I write all these questions down. I say, right, guys, off you go. Sit where you want. Work with whom you wish. Everything is a yes. See you in one hour on the carpet. You can answer one of these questions or all of them. And you can represent your research in any way you wish. It can be a dance, a play, a model, a show, a piece of art, a piece of writing. And your students will show you what they like to do. They will demonstrate it straight away. And you go back and you observe. Wow, negotiation. Look at that leadership over there. Look, wow, look at that communication over there. It's a new way of thinking, but when we reinvent it like this, it's great. And then when we come to reflect, we sit down on the carpet. Okay, guys, what have we got? What did we learn? Can you show us what you've learned? And can you teach the rest of the class? R is for respect. This is really important, obviously. Respect for your children, respect for yourselves, crucial. A Montessori has this really amazing thing called the Peace Rose. You might want to have one in your classroom, if you, especially if you're working with younger children. This is really, really nice. Quite often in school, when I was a child, I used to talk a lot. I used to talk a lot, and I was in trouble a lot. The teacher would say, now, you two, you two are talking. You go over there, and you over there. Separate, and we'd have to move. But then I came to Montessori, and I realized that that wasn't the real world, actually. You know, if I'm in an office and I'm sitting next to my colleague and all I do is talk all day and do no work, I'm sacked. <laughs> my boss, you say, you've done no work. You've been, you've been talking for six months, you've done nothing. You're fired. That's the real world. So what actually should happen in our school is we should allow our students to work it out themselves. And what we do in Montessori is really unique. If two children are talking or arguing or debating or doing something which is not, uh, you know, um, in the culture or the philosophy of our classroom, Another child will appear with the peace rose and say, excuse me, you two, you're talking a bit too loud. I've got the peace rose here. And I'll hand it to child one and say, can you talk while you're holding the peace rose and tell us what your problem is? And say, well, look, he's stolen my pencil. And it's my pencil. Take the peace rose, next child. Well, I thought it was my pencil. I'm sorry about that. Next child, peace rose. And they pass it back and forth. And the peace rose only goes back in the vase when there's peace. But the teacher doesn't do anything. The teacher's still working with a group on guided reading. But the children take initiative in that. S is for socialization. And this goes back to our classrooms and how they um, operate. So a quiet classroom is a failing one. There's a quote I read very recently in a book. It's not mine. We need to make sure our classrooms are uh, close to the real world as possible. Movement, debate, choice, freedom, experimentation, conflict resolution, and noise are all part. And if anyone here is a school principal uh, and you walk down the corridor and you want your classrooms to be silent, think again about that. There should be noisy. There should be movement. There should be some debate. That's what it's all about. T is for trust. We talked about trust before. Building trust with children is fundamental. It's really fundamental, of course. Um, and we're going to do a little activity now to see if we can build some trust with each other because I've been talking for way too long. Actually, very hypocritical of everything I've just said. So please don't judge me, but they gave me 90 minutes. So here's what we're going to do. 
And you can do this with your children too. We're going to turn to the person next to us in a second. And you have to be an active participant. You can't just sit there. Some people are asleep, so I'm obviously terrible at talking. That's fine. Um, you're going to turn to the person next to you. I blame it. Oh, they had a piece of cake maybe at the break and have just gone sugar high. Um, turn to the person next to you. And the first person, this is an active listening activity. The first person is going to turn and talk for three minutes about on something they're scared of, something they have a fear of. You're going to let the person in on something that other people don't know. I'll tell you mine. I'm scared of flying. Fly all over the world. Every flight, I am petrified. I'm going to die. My hands are sweating. I'm listening to the pilot's voice. <gasps> Does he sound vulnerable? Is he going to crash the plane? Does he sound drunk? You know, this, what's happening here? What about the plane? What about the engine, the noise of the engine? Does it sound healthy? The whole flight. I just flew to, uh, to Costa Rica for 15 hours. My hand was raining. I was petrified. I am scared of flying. Very scared. But I do it. Really, it's, a, it's bad. I need to get over it. I know. So you're going to turn to the person next to you. And you're going to tell them about a time you felt particularly petrified. You're going to be honest. The person next to you is going to listen without interrupting, raising an eyebrow, nodding, saying, yes, nothing's going to happen. You're just going to listen really carefully. And then when the person finishes, the listener is going to retell them their story in one minute, paraphrasing it, to prove that they were listening. Now, why are we doing this? Because our children come to us all the time and say, hey, miss, uh, and they want to tell us something, and we just go, get on with it, get on with it. And sometimes even parents are at the door, and you say to little Tommy, hey, Tommy, how was your holiday? Tommy says, well, um, well, were you? And mum goes, we went to the beach, and we had a great time. Wasn't it great? Didn't you have a good time, Tommy? Well, okay, in the class, let's go. And we don't let them talk. This is about active listening. Let them have a voice. So we're going to practice it now. I did this in a conference. Somebody taught me this, so I'm teaching it to you. I'm passing it forward. Okay, are you ready to go? No. Yep. Remember, you have to take, you have to take part. You can't just sit there and do nothing because it's not modeling the behavior you wish to view in your children. Okay, turn to the person next to you. Three minutes. Tell them a time you felt particularly scared. Off you go. You're not doing it. Okay, sorry to interrupt you. I can hear you're having a great chat. So, so the idea with an activity is that you build some trust. You understand that we're all vulnerable, and you can do that in your classroom too. You can have a circle time where you talk about that. A couple of things quickly. Uh, I really apologize. Uh, I put a lot of time into this presentation. Uh, I understand the QR codes aren't working. I apologize for those people who can't get to them. After the presentation, I will send the presentation to all of you so you can all have it. So I'm sorry about that. And last night, because I have to say this, I made this presentation in three hours yesterday morning. Last night I read through it and I noticed that it said quiet instead of quiet. A quiet classroom is failing. And I fixed it this morning when I noticed, but it, the link hasn't been updated, so I'm sorry. You caught me out. Uh, that I spelt something wrong. If I was a deceptive teacher, I would say, well done, I left a mistake in there, well spotted, 10 points to you. But I'm not. Okay, let's continue. Uh, so, understanding, seeking to understand. This is really important. By the way, I hope you're all keeping your eye on the sign language because there's a test at the end. And if you fail, go out. I'm telling your parents. So this is one of them, I think... One of the most important diagrams I've seen, I, I actually stole it from somebody else. Um, it's about differentiation, and we use this word a lot in our schools and our classrooms. Um, obviously, from teachers' perspective, this is really interesting. At the top, you can differentiate those three things. The content, you can decide what you teach. You can decide the process in which you teach it, and you can decide the end product. That's your choice. You get to determine that in your lesson plan. At the bottom, there are your goals. You want growth of your children physically, if they're doing sports, you want it academically, socially, you want them to grow. You want them to be motivated and you want them to be efficient in their work. So the top is what you differentiate and the bottom is your outcome. It's the middle part that we miss. Do we know the readiness of our students for the thing we're about to teach and do we take heed of that? If they're not ready, sometimes we just still teach it, who cares, it doesn't matter. We just do it anyway, because it says it in the curriculum documentation. We just do it. Even though we know it's wrong, and the lesson is a disaster, because they can't get it. 
If they don't know how to multiply, they can't do fractions with different denominators. It's just not happening. But it says week five, fractions with different denominators. The principal says, Barbara, you make sure you teach it. Are they ready? And if they're not ready, you don't teach it. It would be a failure to do so. Do you know the interests of your students? Do you know their hook? Do you know each child in your class? You've done the survey at the beginning. You know what kind of teacher they want. But do you know what they love? And I'll show you something in a second about that. And their learning profile. Do you know how they like to learn? Have you moved your tables around the room and said, sit where you want? If you have, then this diagram will work. But if you haven't done those things, then differentiation is going to be really hard. You're going to be stretched. If you're teaching a multi-age classroom, maybe you've got a, a, you know, um, a class with year one, two, and three in the same room, or even just one and two, you have children in year one and working at kindergarten level, and children in year two are working at year three level. You've got four years to teach in one classroom. Very difficult. But if we have the three middle sections under, underway in our rooms, we've got them all under uh, our grasp, then it will be easier. How do we do it? Well, this is a simple one. There's no point in scanning it, by the way. It doesn't work. So, I mean, forget that. And maybe it does work. I don't know. Uh, some people it's not working for. So, try this. Try it out. Beginning of the term. If you, if you haven't got time to interview your children, haven't got time to sit down and talk each one of them one-on-one, -on -one, ask them to tell you something about themselves. What's your favorite food, your animal, your sport? What's friendship to you, by the way? Uh, what's your hobby? What would you like to be when you're older? Draw me a picture of that and tell me about your best friend. Just put it down for me and collect them in and take heed of them. Have a look at them. If you ever have a disengaged child or a child who is lost or not interested in their work, you have a hook. You look at this and you say, I know what your hobbies are. I know what you want to be when you're older. I know what your favorite animal is. I'm going to incorporate in today's lesson. And you've got them straight away. These are your hooks. When we talk about the hook, the educational hook, do we know what they are of our students? And if we don't, it's time that we found out an easy thing to do, a survey for your students. Piece of cake. Sorry, the clicker is not working again. Hello? Hello? Not working. Okay, V is for variety. A variety of learning experiences in your classroom. Okay, a variety. And we talked about this earlier on, but this is about releasing your children and telling them it's okay to represent your research in any way you wish. I'm not going to tell you to write a report. There are going to be some non-negotiables which are in my curriculum, but when I let my children go away free from my inspirational lesson on snails, I'm going to say to them, now you're inspired by snails or birds. We talked about birds. Now you're inspired by birds and you've asked your questions. Off you go, guys. You can represent your research in any way you wish and here are some options, but you don't have to choose one of these. You can choose one of these if you wish. Drawing, creating posters, making models, performing skits or plays, digital presentations, graphic organizers. Your children will tell you what they want to become when they're older without asking them. They will show you through their work. Your painter, your future Picasso, will come back every time with the painting. Your actor will come back with a skit. I've seen it. It's wonderful. Give them the freedom to choose. And we talk about well-being. Here's a seven-day well-being challenge. Take it on yourself. Do it with your students. Do it in the class. Make it part of who you are in your classroom. We focus on well-being. We're going to do this together. And in the morning when you come to school, you say to the children, hey guys, this week we're talking about well-being. I got 8.1 hours sleep last night. I'm going to put it on my chart. Can you put yours on your chart? And we integrate it with mathematics. We look at data. We look at data analysis. We reflect upon it. We bring it into the real world so they can do that. We measure the, the kilojoules. We measure how many steps we've walked this week. All these things can be brought into the curriculum if we want to. It takes effort and time. And sometimes it's easier to go to the Oxford University Press and turn to page 64 and do a worksheet on fractions. But maybe it's not the best for our children or the best for us. We'll have a more well-rounded classroom when we're doing it with our students. X is for exploration. Obviously, I'm cheating a bit. I, the only word I could find was xylophone, and uh, that didn't fit with my lecture, so I missed it out. Uh, exploration. Here it goes. Uh, we're getting to the end of this alphabet, um, and this comes to practical life. A really amazing Montessori invention, which is beautiful, a um, practical life checklist in your class. All the things on that list you can see right there are in the curriculum. Every single one of them are in the curriculum somewhere. But they're all hands-on. And they're all doable in your classroom. Every single one. 
And you have them for your students when they have finished their work. Quite often what happens is our students finish their work and say, Miss, I finished. And you have to give them an extension activity or fast finishers, and it's garbage. We, fast finishers. Who wants to do more work of the work they have just done? They don't want to do that. They finish their work. They put their work in their drawer. They don't come to you because you're busy. And they go to the practical life checklist and they say, okay, what am I going to do now? Ooh, I'm going to write a letter to the prime minister. That's what I'm doing because that's on my practical life list. And they tick it off and they choose. You don't need to manage those fast finishers. You don't need to have an extension activity. It's there. And they know it's always accessible and it's always a yes. Really important. Why is for you? Teachers, hold your head up. Be proud of who you are. I'm very proud to be a teacher. Uh, my mom is very proud. She walks around the supermarket telling people, did you know my son's a teacher? It's very proud. We've been degraded a little bit, haven't we? We don't go to the doctor and when he writes a prescription and say, um, are you sure that this is the right amount of medication and I am to take it two times a day, not one? We don't because we trust him or her. When we get a house designed by an architect, we don't say, are you sure these measurements are right? We trust them because they are professionals. You are professionals. That's what teachers are. It's a profession because you are professionals. No one should question how you teach. No one should tell you how to teach. You teach in your own unique way. And I lecture at Notre Dame University to the graduates who are heading out into their world just before they go out to apply for their first job. And I say to them, when you go into your first interview and you sit opposite the principal and he offers you the job, or she, before you sign the contract, you look at the principal and you say, if I say yes at this school, do I get to be the teacher that I've always wanted to be? And if he says, there's the curriculum, say those words to those kids and just test them and show me the results, you leave. There's another job down the street. You're in demand now. You're teachers and half of us have left. So now you get to choose. And we need to have a revolution here of like reestablishing what teachers are. You know, the old saying is, without teachers there are no professions. And, you know, maybe it's not wholly true, but it's, it's, it's good enough for me. And I'll read you this quote. Teachers are the catalysts of change, shaping the world one student at a time with unwavering dedication. They ignite minds, nurture dreams, and unlock potential. They empower the future generation with knowledge, compassion, and resilience. As architects of learning, they construct bridges to new horizons, fostering curiosity and critical thinking. Teachers embody hope, guiding the path towards a brighter tomorrow. They impact. Their impact transcends classrooms, leaving an indelible mark on the world. They are the guardians of progress, forging a better future through education. And that is true of every single person in this room. So you should give yourself a round of applause. There's no problem in being proud of who you are. Okay, and Z is for Zen and being calm. And we're going to do a calm activity now, but we're not going to bother uh, because I'm running out of time because I have, I have some more to tell you. And I'm sorry because it's very long and I'm hypocritical and don't judge me. Okay, so what's next? We're going to have a quick chat. We've gone through the A to Z. We've gone through all the things that I thought Montessori had brought into my world when I became mainstream to a Montessori teacher. We've talked about them all. I'd love you to turn to the person next to you and just share, is there anything you're going to do? Any changes you're going to make or something you're going to try? It might not work. <laughs> you might move all your tables tomorrow and go, that guy, he's ruined my classroom. There's chaos in here. Is there anything you're going to try? Of the last 26 slides, that you've, well, 52 slides you've seen, is there anything you're going to do differently? Anything that you think you're going to try in your classroom? We'll have 60 seconds. Just turn to the person next to you and, uh, and share something, please. Okay, guys, so now uh, that's the A to Z done. I hope you've all enjoyed the alphabet and you can remember it. Good. Uh, yes, tricky. Um, now, uh, I'll tell you a story now, and hopefully this part is nice and relaxing and you enjoy it a bit more than the last part. Um, I don't know if you enjoyed it or not, but hopefully you did. Now, um, I was a school principal for five years running a Montessori school, and I quit in 2022. I left my job. Um, I resigned. Uh, I, I thought of something that, uh, that was really big, and I wanted to take it on and try it. And it was really wild and crazy, and my mom said, don't do it. And my, you know, all the people that I met said, don't try it. It's impossible. But I tried it, and, and when I was lucky enough to be at the values-based education conference in the Gold Coast, I'd just started. And now it's 15 months, 
and uh, I want to tell you the story, and then I want to offer it to you. Um, it's completely free. You don't have to, there's no money ever or anything that I'm about to do because I'm not, I'm not a good salesman. So I'm just going to tell you the story and see if you think it would be a great thing to do. Okay, so upschool.co is what I uh, and my teammates, there's a big team, I'll introduce you to them in a second, have uh, organized and created. So in 2021, I was working at school and I was running my Montessori school and Montessori schools are known for having no tech. But we were all told, right now, you need to teach online. Get Zoom and start Zooming it to everybody. And my teacher's like, oh my God, Gavin, I, I can't even type in Microsoft Word. How am I going to use Zoom? I said, okay, don't worry. I'll run the school for two weeks. I'll teach all the classes. And you just stay at home and watch. And uh, hopefully, you know, we'll do some training. You'll get on board with it. So I started teaching online in school and at home. And each night, I was reading a story to, uh, online. And in the beginning, I had uh, four children coming to the story time. And then at the end, I had 20,000 coming every night. And it was on all the news channels in Australia. It was really cool. By the way, I am wearing uh, shorts in that picture. I'm not just sitting in my pants, so you know that. Uh, I had somebody say at a conference, are you wearing any trousers? You know, just to let you know, I was running early, and I have shorts on. Um, so I was teaching. And every day I was sending this Zoom link out to my children, my 50 children in my school. Sending the Zoom link out. Some parents had decided, oh, we're not even coming today. We're actually going on holiday. Or we've gone to Byron Bay. We moved to our country house. And I was doing all this effort all night preparing lessons online. And I had 20 children turning up. But online I had 200,000 followers through my work in Nepal and writing books and whatnot. So I thought, I bet there's loads of kids out there who don't have a school today. So I went to my board and I said, look, I'm going to try this thing. I've got the link to Zoom. I'm just going to put it online and open it to everyone. And so I did. And the lesson you can see there is a lesson on um, uh, photosynthesis on a leaf. They're the particles of hydrogen and oxygen mixing in a leaf. And I pl planned a lesson. I put it online. And 15,000 children came to the lesson from all over the world. They were all there. Everybody came. It was amazing. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. So I quit my job. I went to my board and said, I'm leaving. My board said, you can't leave. You're the Montessori ambassador. You're running our school. You're the school principal. I said, I'm so sorry. I tell the kids, you always follow your dream. You've got to go for it. Take a chance. And now I'm doing it. I'm leaving. And I told, announced it to the children. They were crying and I was crying. It was really hard. Uh, but I left. And uh, I missed the school a lot. But I opened with my uh, dear colleagues, Up School. And Up School is an online school where it's completely free for everybody around the world to come to school for free. And I'm the teacher. And I've been working very hard for 15 months to make it something. Here's our team. We have a group all around the world, Nepal, India, uh, Australia, in certain cities. Um, and we've been working really hard for 15 months to make something which we think is unique. And I'll explain it to you in a second. At the very end, I'll show you a video. And if the video doesn't make you cry, uh, then uh, I don't know. But it probably will, so get your tissues ready. Around the world, we've got the NEP 2020. In India, anybody who's worked in India will know the new government policy is called the NEP, National Education Policy. It states you must include SDG 13, climate change, in your curriculum. It's sweeping the world. So lots of countries are falling in line with this, saying, oh my goodness, we've only got six years left to meet the requirements of the United Nations SDGs. We better get on with it. And so 1.5 billion people in India now are talking about the SDGs. So what have we done? All of our courses are aligned with the SDGs to make the world a better place, which is brilliant, and we love that. Each and every session has teacher training. Teacher training for your teachers for every single lesson, every module, everything is delivered. We have teacher training along with that, along with the things we've just talked about. Our unique, and this is obviously, I got to write my own job description, which is great, uh, but our, our niche was that we wanted to bring the wonders of the world to the children who weren't able to access them. So if you're a child living in Nepal, you will never see the ocean and you'll never hear a wave. There's a 95% chance you'll never see the ocean. It's very sad to just think about that, right? But they are at the perils of climate change because if the climate change happens, and it is happening, glaciers will melt, no runoff water, no water in their villages, no life. They're in trouble. And in their curriculum, they have protect the ice caps. We may as well tell them to protect Jupiter. It's that far away from them. So what we decided at UpSchool was we would go to the most remote locations in the world and teach about the things that mattered and beam it into schools. So we're only going 15 months. So this year, we've been to the North Pole, 
lessons on polar bears with the polar bear where that plant is and I'm over here this week we're learning about polar bears oh my god it's coming and uh, it was very scary but it was amazing we've been to the South Pole lessons in front of 1.3 million penguins we've been to the Himalayas we've been to the largest rainforest in the world we've been to uh, Costa Rica to film lessons in sloths you name it trying to bring the abstract world to children so they can believe it exists and want to change it and save it all of these things are live and pre-recorded also so children can access them at any point they wish. It's important that you know that we have charity partners. Some of these you might know. Jane Goodall Institute, you will definitely know. And the reason we have these charity partners is so our children can do meaningful work in the world and I'll explain how in just a second. I will tell you about one of these charities. We've hand-picked them very carefully for a reason. Look at So They Can, Educate to Empower. They rescue girls in Uganda who were about to be sold at 13 to an old man who's 70 to be his new wife. They rescue them and put them in school. $15 will rescue one child for one year. So we give children a chance to rescue a girl in Uganda, which is completely abstract to them. If you look at the uh, charity, the John Fawcett Foundation, for $5, this charity restores blind children's eyesight in Indonesia. We give children a chance to restore other children's eyesight and I'll tell you how in just a second because the reason I tell you this is I would love it to happen in your school I would love this to happen in your school so here's some of the courses that we have uh, we have many but there are many of these um, all different of course uh, most of them are 10 weeks and they come with a full program teaching program aligned with the IB that you can edit full assessment everything you need is there you do zero work there's nothing for you to do I've written you the program it's all done. All the task cards, the worksheets, the videos, the intro, the outro, it's all done for you. You need to do zero. So I'm not giving you more work because I'm a teacher myself and I know new things are a burden. I'll share with you a couple of courses and tell you a couple of heartwarming stories and then I'll stop talking. I'm a children's author. author. I've written lots of books uh, and I wanted to allow children to write a real story. What happens in our classrooms is we say we're going to write a story. In fact, it's the most common lesson on earth, writing a story. And what do you do? They write a story in their book, they draw a picture, they give it to you, you tick it, it goes in the cupboard, and they take it home at the end of the term. That's not a story that changes the world. We have a course here where children get to come, choose a topic, choose a mission, choose a key message, write a story, learn about adjectives, adverbs, personification, paragraphs, all that stuff. They write a manuscript. Then they illustrate it in Canva with our guidance for free. Every child gets a free Canva Pro account who enrolls in our program. Then they illustrate their own book, and then they publish it, just like him. His name is Divyam Malpani from Calcutta. He's 13. He wrote this book, and just as he pressed publish, like every child who presses publish on the platform, it says, hey, Divyam, just before you submit your book, which charity would you like the profits to go to? And Divyam chose the John Fawcett Foundation. He put the book on the platform. There's now 5,000 books on the platform and coming every day. And he sold 60 copies in one day. I met him on Zoom with his mum, and I told him, you've restored 30 children's eyesight in Indonesia. They were blind a month ago, and now they can see Divyam. And he started crying in Zoom. And he said, I have to go. I said, where are you going? He said, I have to write another book. And that is what we need to do. That's the power of purposeful education. Give them the power to know that the work that they do changes the world in some way and it's all they'll want to do. He would write a trillion stories because he knows the power of writing a story. Just to let you know, when the book goes on the library, people around the world can buy it, order copies, we do all of that. And the change, he gets a notification of the change he's made. Be the change is aligned with the SDGs. This is one where children get to choose an SDG from the United Nations. They work in a group and they tackle it, they achieve it. We've had children around the world doing amazing things, amazing stuff. This example here is a school in Nasik, India, just outside Mumbai in the wine regions. They decided to plant a forest. And I'll show you the video in just a second, which will melt your heart. Not only did they decide to plant a forest and do SDG 13, they decided to take on SDG number four, which is quality education. Just down the road from their school, there was another school with children who were in a lower caste. And you know the caste system in India. This caste was the untouchables, the ones you do not go near. And the children said, no, 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 no. They're human beings like us. We're going to plan lessons. We're going to make sandwiches. You're going to see this in a second. And we're going to go to that school. Even though everyone says you can't go to a lower caste and talk to them. And we're going to teach them. 
And we're going to feed them and tell them the power of eating fresh and healthy food. And you'll see the video, and it's beautiful. They did that. They took on the course. They followed the 10-week process, and they changed the world. Actually changing a culture, you know, a thousand-year-old culture of caste system, they're breaking it down. It's brilliant, giving them the power to be able to do that. And the last one is a school in Dwarka Expressway, Delhi Public School in Delhi. Huge school, massive, looks like the Colosseum uh, in Greece. Thousands of children, I think, you know, I can't remember how many, 10,000 children. The principal drives around on a golf cart. It's huge, this place. The children decided they were going to plant their very own forest. So they wrote a letter to the education minister and the health minister. They got some land gifted right outside their school. They wrote to a prominent billionaire. He received 20,000 letters in the post. He then gave them a bit of land. They planted 25,000 trees. I went for the inauguration and I asked one of the girls, how will you know when this forest is a success? And she said, I'll know it's a success when the first bird arrives. We've never seen a bird at our school. We've already started a bird watching club and there were some children with binoculars in the window. <laughs> the saplings were only 10 centimeters high, but they were already looking. This is the power of what we want to do. And I'm going to finish, not quite because you've got a test, don't forget at the end. I'm going to finish with this video is now going to play miraculously, I hope. Yes? Okay, it's coming. Why did you decide to create a school and a school so wonderful as this one? I wanted to do something on my own and uh, uh, which deeply connects to me. Uh, I always th thought to bring opportunities for children uh, to experience more, to explore and if they can find their talents and we can help them nurture uh, those talents and they're able to live their passion. So something on these lines I would say that was the thought behind starting this school. So six months ago, uh, we released the course Be The Change on the UpSchool platform. Be The Change is designed to allow children to choose an SDG from the United Nations, one that matters to them, and then they embark on this journey where they take on social activities in their community to try to change the world. Uh, your school was one of the pioneers of that course. You were one of the first people to enroll. Why did you choose Be The Change and what attracted you to the course? I was looking at opportunity that how do I integrate a project-based learning system in my school. With the new education policy coming, I wanted to have a, an integrated project where the whole school participates. And on the top of it, I am really keen and passionate about skill-based learning. So uh, to get the ball rolling, I said I, I came across Be the Change, and I felt that you know this is this is it. You know, let let's get started. And it helped me deliver the complete project-based learning experience where students actually towards the end took action and the action that they took was you know they were they're planting trees in the forest they are teaching a school that is not well resourced like ours and they're also you know doing a food donation drive they're delivering food out there and all of this my students are happy these amazing children around us here have chosen zero hunger and just down the street there is a school where children don't get fed every single day in fact, sometimes there is no food for those children. However, these children here at Rise Experiential School have decided that they're going to stop all of that. They collect food, they bring it from their homes, and as you can see, they make sandwiches and they head down to a school just down the street to help the world become a better place by feeding those who find it very, very hard to get food. Now this one you're doing today is SDG what? SDG for quality education. Quality education. Every week or every few weeks, you get these children together. Yes. Now, this is not your school, is it? No, no, it's not us. So why are you here? Uh, we just want to uh, make them aware of the outside world because uh, their, their thinking is very con conservative. So we, we want to make them more no knowledgeable about the outside world. Right, okay. So it feels good for me to help them oh. see their satisfying faces. It gives a very different satisfaction that I am a human being and I am able to help everyone. Your children have chosen zero hunger and quality education. 
one group of children has designed lesson plans within their own school and resources, and another group has made sandwiches and food, and they travel to your school together, and then they visit your school, and when they arrive, one group teaches your children, and then afterwards they all eat food and talk about how healthy that food is. I mean, it's pretty amazing to think that that's happening in the world. We got connected with our school and the SDG goals which were introduced to us through the program which you initiated, Be The Change. There, from there, leadership quality was developed in them because they started planning the things. It's not only the skill which they develop, but the attitude has also changed. It's like empathy, sympathy, both the things which are strongly reflected by them. Now this morning we've traveled from Rise Experiential School. We've hopped on the bus. We've traveled with all of these wonderful saplings to this remote area in India. It's very hot. What are you doing here? We are planting trees here to provide some shade and habitat for the birds and animals. I understand you've got a sapling loan. You have yes. to give them back. Yes. That's amazing. So you didn't take a money loan. No. You took a sapling loan. Yes, we take a tree transaction. Yeah, a tree transaction. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I love that. Wow, so you're literally planting your own forest. Yes. It's amazing to see the work that you're doing here. It's just amazing to see you have this team. And this, in a few months, will be a forest yeah. with shade, yeah. and birds will be singing, and butterflies will be flying. How will you feel when you return and it looks like that? So after some time, I'll, I'll see the trees are grown, people are sitting, chill, and talk with the others, children are playing. I feel so happy that I have planted these trees a few years ago, that they are grown. Our students have taken few initiatives uh, with the support of UpSchool. I can see uh, the impact they have created uh, in the society. And at the same time, the learning which is going on while doing all these projects is, is commendable. This week, we have been in Nasik in India with Rise Experiential School. As you know, absolute magic happened in this part of the world. The children here have collected their own food resources. They made sandwiches. They've organized tree plantations, written letters, made phone calls, planted their very own forest, all in the cause of making the world a better place. And I can safely say that this week, they have 100% succeeded in making the big blue ball that we all live on a little bit better. Don't be fooled thinking it's thank you. No, it is thank you. You're right. I'm just joking. It wasn't really a hard test. Um, thank you for uh, having me. It's been amazing to be here. Sorry it's been so long, but uh, yeah, I just deal with the cards I'm dealt with. Uh, and uh, Shamini gave me 90 minutes, so I'm here for 90 minutes. I really appreciate all your time, and we will get the slides to you, I promise. And last thing, and this is I hate doing this, but I'll do it anyway. I wrote a book. It's about a potential in every child. If you want it, it's available in Singapore, and the QR code should take you there. Um, and thank you. I appreciate your time. Have a lovely day.